is it clear uh, yes sir it is visible right okay so we'll basically start off with what is the definition of a visual field a uh, visual field is basically defined as that environment that is visible to a steadily fixing eye and where he described this classically as a hill of vision which is surrounded by a sea of darkness so before we know what is abnormal field we need to know what the boundaries of a normal field are so the boundaries are defined as a superior extent of 50 degrees uh, the nasally it extends up to 60 degrees inferiorly up to 70 degrees and the maximum extent of the field is temporally which is up to 90 degrees so what is automated static perimetry a static perimetry basically it quantifies the sensitivity of a patient's visual field threshold using efficient and standardized testing algorithms the difference between a static perimetry and a kinetic perimetry is in a static perimetry the background illumination as well as the look uh, the sensitivity the stimulus sensitivity keeps uh, the alter the stimulus sensitivity whereas in kinetic perimetry the location of the stimulus is altered so that helps in charting out isoptics whereas in static perimetry just the stimulus location as well as the stimulus sensitivities are altered uh, this is an important curve that we need to know in terms of perimetry this is called the fosc or the frequency of the scene curve this is basically charting uh, the threshold that is how frequently a stimulus can be perceived against the intensity of light in this case the intensity of light has been shown on a decibel scale before it is reducing around x axis so we see as the decibel scale reduces or in other words as the intensity of light increases the frequency of seeing increases so this curve can be interpreted in multiple ways basically if the location that we are testing if it's a normal area the curve tends to be steep in the locations where the field is abnormal the curve tends to get shallow and in case of generalized depression the curve will completely shift to the right again like i explained the relation between light intensity and stimulus attenuation has to be understood a positive is a, is a unit for light intensity it's also expressed as candela per meter square and it's an absolute unit and decibels is an inverse it has an inverse relationship it is basically a unit for light attenuation and it's expressed in logarithmic units so basically retinal sensitivity like i said is directly proportional to the decibel scale and it's inversely proportional to the apostrophe scale so a low decibel reading which is seen in the uh, raw data it indicates a high stimulus intensity which in turn indicates a low retinal sensitivity at that point and on conversely if there is a high decibel reading that indicates a low stimulus intensity by the perimeter which in turn indicates a high retinal sensitivity at that point now before we go into reading static perimetry or hfa visual field reports we need to know two things basically the point patterns and the testing strategies a point pattern is how the particular points are distributed over the visual field and strategy is the time intensity as well as the bracketing technique that is used to identify the thresholds so basically visual field tests are divided into threshold test and screening test or super threshold test the threshold tests further are divided into multiple sub groups depending on the location of the points the central test will be what we'll be dealing with today because this is primarily involved with glaucoma screening there are peripheral tests and specialty tests which are used for neurological fields also so point patterns are basically divided into multiple types mainly based on five points first is the extent of field that it tests second is the relation of the points to the horizontal and the vertical axis third is the point density that is the distance between two constitutive points uh, in terms of degrees four is the total number of points to be tested and five is the bare area which is the area around fixation where there will be no points so point patterns which are used for suspected cases of glaucoma or early established glaucoma cases are mainly the 30-2 the 24-2 and the nasal step the nasal step is a program which is used for very early cases of glaucoma so the most common used are the 30-2 and the 24-2 in the 30-2 like i said the previous five points can be highlighted as the central 30 degrees have been covered there are no points on the horizontal or the vertical axis the point density in other words if this uh, the area of separation between two consecutive points is 6 degrees the total number of points covered are 76 and the bare area that is the central area around fixation where there are no points is 3 degrees the 30-1 pattern is exactly the same as the 30-2 except for the fact that points are aligned along the horizontal and vertical axis and the second point is because points are aligned around the horizontal and vertical axis the central bare area increases to 6 degrees that is the separation 
24-2 is a subset of the 30-2 where the outer set of points have been excluded except for two nasal points that you see here. So this totally again has no points on the central axis. The total number of points covered are 54. The point density is 6 degrees just like the 30-2. The central bare area is 3 degrees. If you go for the 24-1, exactly like the 30-1, everything is the same except for the area covered and the total number of points. The nasal step pattern, like I said, is used only for detection of very early nasal step defects that are seen in glaucoma. The area tested is between the peripheral 30 degrees and the peripheral 50 degrees, where there are two points above and below each of these metals, and there are two isolated points which are seen in the 30 degrees in the nasal area also. The total number of points covered in this is 14. Now, the point patterns that we covered in advanced glaucoma are namely the 10 2 and the macular profile. This is in the central 10 degrees, the 10 2. It again has no points on the central axis. The total point density, that is the distance between two consecutive points, is 2 degrees. The total points covered are 68 degrees, and the central bare area is only 1 degree. And the macular program is used for very advanced cases of glaucoma, primarily to detect a macular split. This is distributed only in the central three degrees of the field. This again has no points along the central axis. The point density, just like the 10-2, is only two degrees, and the total point covered is 16 degrees with a bare area of one degree. Our testing strategies, like I mentioned before, are divided into super threshold, which are also called screening or qualitative tests, and the threshold or quantitative tests. Earlier, we used to use the full threshold strategy of the fast pack, but these are very lengthy. They take about 10 to 14 minutes per hour. So it's very long and it's mainly reserved only for uh, research purposes. The newer thresholding strategies called the CETA standard and the CETA fast are now being used. The newer uh, model of the HFA, the HFA 3 also has a CETA faster program. So how does this full threshold work? Is it full threshold basically does a 4-2 bracketing technique wherein there are two crossing overs over the threshold. So like if this is the threshold area and if the initial stimulus presented is seen by the patient, then the stimulus intensity is reduced in steps of four decibels till it crosses over the threshold point once. And then it is further increased in steps of two decibels till it again crosses over to the seen area. So there are two crossing overs that we make up in the full threshold. So according to this, the best threshold resolution will be about two decibels. That is the second step. The fast pack strategy just uses one crossing over where if the initial stimulus is seen, the stimulus intensity is reduced in steps of three decibels then it crosses over the threshold once. So the best uh, theoretical best resolution that we see is three decibels. The CETA strategy is all the Swedish interactive thresholding algorithm. They basically work by uh, if once based on the patient's responses, once the responses have reached a statistically significant level, the perimeter stops presenting stimuli further. So it helps in cutting down the time or uh, total testing duration and increases the testing uh, uh, reliability and also reduces patient fatigue. And this also happens without losing any important data during the perimetry test. This again has divided into two parts. That is the CETA standard, which is basically cutting the time of the full threshold algorithm by half and the CETA fast, which reduces the time of the fast pack strategy by half. So this is like a cheat sheet that we can use in different patients of glaucoma. If it's a suspect, we either, stand, either go with a 30-2 point pattern with a CETA standard strategy or a 24-2 point pattern with a CETA standard strategy. In established glaucoma, the best preferred is a 24-2 with a CETA standard. And in advanced glaucoma, we need to highlight more of the central field, around the field around the fixation. So we we'll go up with the 10-2 CETA standard, the 10-2 CETA fast if the patient is unable to sit through a full CETA standard. The macular program, like I said, is mainly used to highlight if there is a macular split, we can see. Elderly patients, again, and even younger patients who are unable to sit through a full course perimetry, we can go for the theta first strategy. Uh, potential sources of error during a perimetry test is if the wrong patient data is entered, if the wrong eye has been entered, because based on the eye entered, the uh, blind spot charting takes place. So all the fixation losses, the cash trials that are given, are based on the uh, blind spot. If the wrong eyes enter, the blind spot charting will go wrong and else the reliability indices will go wrong. Wrong entry of data of birth will indicate that the normative data against which this is compared is totally wrong. Inattention to change of refraction because if the wrong refraction is entered, there will be a generalized depression that we can see. Uncomfortable positioning or a physical disability can lead to positional errors. If the patient's head is not resting properly or if there is a head tilt, Again, you know, the nose can introduce an artifact, rim artifacts can come in. 
and if the patient uh, the test is being performed in an overly lit or noisy crowded room the patient can do a lot of false positive results now this is basically a full single field printout that we are seeing it's divided into 10 zones now again these 10 zones there are two areas first is which is independent of normal data and start pack analysis is the first four zones that is the patient data or the test data along with the stimulus data the strategy that we used and the point pattern and the pupil diameter as well as refraction second is the reliability indices and the fourier threshold the raw data that the perimeter measures and the base scale these are independent of stack pack analysis in the hfo and the remaining six zones that is a total deviation numerical and pattern uh, probability plots the pattern deviation numerical and probability plots the global indices and the glaucoma hemifluid test these undergo stack pack analysis so they can do uh, they can be com compared to a normative database and the statistical analysis gives us a result from this there are mainly 10 steps in a single field analysis first of all the most important is to verify the patient data is entered correctly because like i mentioned the wrong normative database will be used for comparison analysis reliability indices can be used along with the gray scale to see if the test is reliable or not if it is not reliable and if the reliability indices are out of the accepted limit the test has to be rejected fovial sensitivity should correlate with the visual acuity if the fovial sensitivity low is low and the visual acuity is normal that could indicate that there is an earlier fovial affection on the other hand if the fovial sensitivity is normal but the visual acuity is low that could indicate that uh, the patient's refraction entered is wrong so again the perimeter report will go wrong blind spot positioning has to be correct because all the false positive test trials take place here the total deviation and the pattern deviation probability plot can be used to determine if there is a generalized or localized depression psd and ghd are used to determine early defects whereas the total deviation numerical plot and the md index can be used to further follow up the patient pattern deviation plot has a role in earlier defects once the field defects mode become more generalized the utility of the pattern deviation numerical and probability plot data that is where we have to shift into seeing the raw data only so this is the patient data there are certain constant parameters like is uh, the fixation monitor which is by default the blind spot the color is the stimulus in the standard sap mode is the white stimulus and the background illumination is 30.1.5 1.5 pulse strips these are fixed the parameters that can be varied are the fixation either we use the central fixation we can use the small diamond the large diamond or the lower led also stimulus size is 3 by default it can be increased to size 5 or reduced to size 1 depending upon you and the threshold patterns and strategies like i mentioned before uh, reliability indices are mainly three the fixation losses uh, ideally fixation in in early case of glaucoma or if you are suspecting a case of glaucoma it is best if you keep the reliability indices as close to zero as possible but if you are following up an established case of glaucoma the acceptable limits of the reliability indices are fixation losses up to 20 are acceptable Uh, false positive rates up to 33 are considered okay. Anything above that, we will have to reject the fee. And similarly, a false negative rate about 33 will have to be rejected. High false positive rates indicate a trigger happy patient, and high false negative rates can indicate fatigue or inattentiveness in early cases. Whereas in advanced cases of glaucoma, it can also be seen up to 50% false negative rates can be seen, uh, even in if the test has been reliably done. That is because of the variability in advanced glaucoma. So the raw data, like I said, uh, this gives the exact retinal sensitivity at all the tested points. In this case, it's uh, at HFA. The values will range between zero to forty decibels, where zero indicates an absolute scotoma, and forty decibels indicates the highest sensitivity. This is usually seen around the fovea, between thirty to thirty-five, and in the periphery, the uh, sensitivity will progressively drop. The gray scale is the representation of the raw data in terms of this chart here. So there are basically ten groups, each in the steps of five, except the last group, which is about a step of ten. And here, between forty-one and fifty decibels, there is one group. The remaining, they are all in steps of five. So if each is assigned a particular uh, gray scale to determine the area, and this is again an absolute scale. This is not compared to any normative data. There is no analysis that takes place in this. The total deviation numerical plot is basically the once the stack pack analysis starts setting in. The raw data is compared to normative database, and it's converted to the total deviation numerical plot. So, a value of zero in the total deviation numerical plot is very important. This is very different from the raw data. 
a value of zero here indicates that that particular point has zero deviation from the normal value or in other words it's a perfectly normal point whereas if you see a value of zero in the raw data that indicates an absolute scope this has to be remembered if there is a positive value that indicates that the sensitivity at that point is higher than normal then a negative value indicates a lower sensitivity and the global indices namely the mean deviation and the pattern standard deviation are derived from the total deviation numeric plot the box plot in the change analysis is also taken from this but it is no longer used the total deviation probability plot is just like the gray scale it assigns a probability value to the uh, numerical data seen in the numerical plot the pattern deviation numerical plot is used by converting the total deviation numerical plot basically it reduces the deviation by taking the seven best sensitivity point and that value is added to all the numerical values in the total deviation numerical plot so that a generalized kotova or the generalized depression part of the total deviation plot is eliminated and any localized kotovas get highlighted by this again the pattern deviation numerical plot the same uh gray scale is applied to this and it is converted into a probability plot uh global indices are mainly three the mean deviation which is mainly divided like i said earlier from the total deviation numerical plot this is an average of all the numerical values that are seen in the total deviation numerical plot and uh, the pattern standard deviation is the standard deviation around the mean of the total deviation numerical plot values visual field index is a more reliable uh, global index because it is less dependent upon media opacity is a pupil size as compared to the mean deviation and also it gives a bit of center weighting where points which are closer to the fovea have a higher uh, effect on the visual field status as points compared to the periphery so this is ranged as a percentage between 0 to 100 where 0 indicates a completely blind field and 100 indicates a perfectly normal field this uh, these two indices that is the short term fluctuation and the corrective pattern standard deviation are only available in the full threshold or fast track strategies they are not used in the sequence strategies so the short term fluctuation is basically an index of input test variation normally the value should have been less than 2.5 decibel after we deduct the short term fluctuation from the psd we get the corrective pattern standard deviation so these are a few sample fields that we see if the field effect is a purely localized effect you can see that the total deviation probability and the pattern deviation probability plot will be very similar when we go to the global indices the mean deviation value will depend upon the extent of the localized effect but the pattern standard deviation will have a high value if there is a uniform generalized effect like this total deviation probability plots or the pattern deviation probability plots they both will be almost exactly identical and when you go to the global indices the mean deviation value will be slightly high but it will depend upon the extent of the field effect but the psd value will still be high when we go to a uniform generalized effect like you can see in cataracts or in case of incorrect refraction the total deviation probability plot will show a generalized effect like this whereas when we see the probability plot of the pattern deviation it will be almost clear with bearing seven points uh, and the global indices will show a high md value and a low yes fine when there is a uniform when there is a generalized effect along with the localized kotoma that is when the probability plots will show this sort of a picture the, after we correct for the seventh best sensitivity you can see that the generalized effect has been eliminated and only the localized kotoma is highlighted in the pattern deviation probability plot here both the mean deviation as well as the pattern standard deviation value will be high uh then we come to the last step that is the glaucoma hemifield test this is basically there are the field, the points in the visual field are charted along the rnfl uh, bundles so five zones in the superior hemifield are compared to five zones in the inferior hemifield and any significant difference between them is used to give a particular result the five possible results depending upon the statistical significance of the difference is Uh, charted here it can either be outside normal limits if there is a definite abnormal borderline if it doesn't form and fall under the category of outside normal limits generalized reduction of sensitivity or abnormally high sensitivity and if all these don't classify then it comes under the normal category the ghd is derived from the pattern deviation numerical plot and another point is that ghd cannot be derived in 
case of the 10 dash 2 pattern. This is mainly for the 24 or the 30 dash 2 pattern. Uh, the case tracker, this is an optional system which is available. This is not available in all the parameters. This is used to check for fixation losses. So when we're using the CETA strategy, an upward deviation indicates a fixation loss, and the extent of the deviation indicates the magnitude of the deflection. So a higher deflection indicates a greater fixation loss, lower deflection indicates a small. Downward deviation, if it's a large downward deviation, it indicates a blade. Small downward deviation indicates that the, the machine could not track the eye movement properly. So this has an accuracy of about one to two degrees. And lastly, we'll go to the Andersons and Patella criteria. This is used to basically classify if a field effect uh, criteria, the Andersons and Patella field effects that we use for HFA. So this basically is used to determine if a particular field is abnormal. It has mainly three criteria. That is, a patient should have an abnormal glaucoma hemifield test. In the total deviation plot, we should see that total of pattern deviation plot, there should be three contiguous knowledge points for the 30 dash 2. If it is a 24 dash 2, we can even use the, the edge points where the p value, that is the probability value, should be less than 5. And of those, at least one should have a probability value less than 1. And the pattern standard deviation for the CETA strategies or the corrected pattern standard deviation should have a p value of less than 5. Now, this, these particular criteria should be repeatable over two tests. Only then it is called as an abnormal test. I'll just uh, finish with a few common field effects that we see. So, like I said, the nasal step. This is important because we need to do a structural correlation to localize the field effect. If you're doing an ONH analysis, so a nasal step is a relatively early field effect that we see. Uh, in the nasal step, if you see the raw data, this is basically seen as a field effect across the horizontal meridian, where one particular, the lower field is abnormal, whereas well the upper field is completely normal. It can also be that the actual threshold sensitivities at this point may be normal, but there will be a gross difference across the horizontal meridian. So this could indicate an early field effect. A paracentral scotoma is one of the most common early field effects that we see. And if you go to check the optic nerve head, you may see that there may be an early, uh, like you could say, an incomplete notch, which is not extended up to the rim. Then when the defect on the ONH effect extends up to the rim in a particular, say, the upper uh, the field is affected, we get this sort of a defect, which is called a germ scotoma or an arcuate scotoma. And if uh, there's a bipolar defect, you can get a ring scotoma or the double arcuate scotoma. The temporal wedge defect is a very rare defect that's seen in less than 3 to 5% cases. And this is affected if the nasal retina is first affected by glaucoma. A few artifacts that we can see in a glaucoma diagnosis. First is if a patient is improperly positioned, like if his head is tilted, the nose may come in the way. And so you may get an artifactual change. If the pupil size is small, like I said, you may get a generalized depression. Also with an improper refraction. If you get a high false positive error, like it's greater than 33 or even higher, you can get a lot of white scotomas. Like you see in this case, the, uh, the blind spot is not at all visible and the field is completely white, the gray scale. So these are all white scotomas indicator of a trigger happy patient. High false negative errors may give this sort of field, which is called a cloverleaf field. So basically the initial four points in each quadrants are were charted properly. And after that, patients started losing it attention or started getting fatigued, so the remaining tests started appearing flat. Uh, I'll just go quickly over the glaucoma progression analysis and then shift over to OCT. So GPA analysis is the analysis that is used in the newer uh, programs. Initially, we used to use the GCP, which is not very common nowadays. So th this has two groups, that the event-based analysis, which is a GP alert and the GCPM. Uh, so GP alert is just a plain language alert which gives you whether, uh, while comparing two fields, initially it takes two baseline reliable fields, and any subsequent field is compared to the baseline to determine if there is any significant locomotive progression. So if any three points in this show statistically significant progression on two particular fields, it is uh, tagged as pro possible progression. And if that same defect is seen over three successive fields, it is tagged as likely progression. And this is called the glaucoma change probability map. If a field defect which is significant as compared to the baseline is seen the first time, it is marked as a completely empty triangle. Same thing is seen over two successive fields, a half filled triangle. And if it is seen over three successive fields, a completely filled triangle will be. A trend based analysis is basically, it gives uh, the rate of change 
of uh, the mean deviation of the visual field index over 5 to 15 fields. So it gives you a rate of change. Now, the advantage of a trend-based analysis, it is uh, less uh, dependent on outliers. So if there is one particular uh, field which is not too reliable, that is, uh, the trend-based analysis can overlook that. The mean deviation slope is gives the MD plot. So in this, as we can see in this particular rate, the rate of progression that we see is given as minus 3.7, which is quite significant. Normally, it should be below 0 0.08. And a VFI is calculated using the pattern deviation plot. The disadvantage is that if uh, the mean deviation is about 20 or 22 decibels, the pattern deviation plot is not uh, created at all. It is not possible. So in that cases, we cannot do a VFI analysis or even a trend analysis. So there are two particular printouts. This is a single field analysis printout uh, that we see. Basically, this particular the present test is compared to the two baselines and uh, the G GPA alert as well as the GCP maps up for good. And this is a GPA summary report where along with the two baseline fields, every subsequent field is shown in a series of succession so that we can do a trend analysis as well as compare each individual field to the baseline to determine if there is any significant change. Uh, so now I'll shift over to OCT. Basically, uh, why is OCT important in glaucoma is because- Karthik, Karthik, uh, yes, I think uh, you can just summarize at least in five lines, what are yeah. the most important things that the students should know as far as the fields are concerned? So first thing is that the raw data that we need to enter, uh, the patient uh, data that we enter, like I said, it has to be accurate because if a wrong age is entered, the normative data will be will go completely haywire. All the further analysis will be wrong. Okay. Very important is checking the strategies, every particular uh, follow field should be the same strategy and point pattern. Point patterns can vary, but strategy should be the same. The strategy is different, we cannot compare fields. So uh, then pupil diameter, like I said, again, they sh should be comparable. If a particular test has been done with a pupil diameter of three and subsequent pupil diameter is five, then we need to reconsider the test because they may not be very comparable. Okay. Important is look at the test duration. Based on the strategy, we have an ab ab uh, approximate idea of how long the test should take. If it's a CETA standard, five to six minutes. If you see a test duration of about 10 minutes, that indicates that the patient is struggling and it may not be a very reliable test. Okay. When we look... Uh, uh, one, two things I want you to specifically tell the students. One is that uh, how, when should be the ideal time to do the first field test for any glaucoma patient? Ideal times is when we are first suspecting the patient. As soon as the patient has been suspected or diagnosed, that is the first time we generally advise a field test. That is, you have to do a field test is mandatory before you even spend the word of glaucoma or a disc suspect or a glaucoma suspect. So it's very important that it is to be done immediately. What, yes. is, the, uh, what is the time duration between two successive field tests? Our students will like to know because it's an exam question. Uh, the time duration depends on the recommendations generally state that there has to be at least three to five tests done within the first two years. So based on the risk, if the patient is a new uh, case why, of... Why, why should uh, five tests be done in two years? That is another question they should know. Because generally the GP analysis, it requires a minimum of three tests to start. So um, for a baseline, we need a minimum of two reliable tests. And about two to three tests, the first test will generally, there will be a big learning curve. Patients may not do it well. So we need at least two to three tests before we can do any sort of trend analysis or progression analysis reliably. And okay. so, so in short, uh, can I, am I audible now? So me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now it is better. Yeah. So uh, in short, for any statistical analysis to kick up, the first is to have three reliable tests. And the second is to have five reliable tests. So unless the statistical package kicks in, you can't know whether the patient is worsening or the patient is stable. So that was an excellent point by Karthik that this is very important. And the whole idea of doing a field test is to know whether the patient is stable or worsening. So any machine that does not have a software to detect progression cannot be used for doing uh, clinical glaucoma practice. That is what everybody should know. And there are only two uh, companies that offer uh, validated software that is Octopus and Humphrey. So that is another question you may be asked in the exam. Okay, Karthik, we can move on to OCT and then we can take the questions at the end. Yes, sir. So uh, I just covered the functional evaluation. Now we'll go to structural evaluation. 
uh, main numerous studies they've shown that structural loss tends to precede functional loss and about 60% of the RNFL needs to be lost before any particular field loss can be detected. There are three main imaging criteria, uh, modalities available, that is the OCT, HRT and GTX. Today I'll be covering mainly the OCT because OCT has been found through multiple studies to be superior to be GTX and HRT for glaucoma practice. And again, OCT has two variants, the older time domain and the newer uh, spectral domain. So for uh, the principle of an optical coherence tomogram is the Michelson's interferometry. The difference between the, you just need to know what the difference between the older time domain and the present spectral domain. The older time domain had a moving mirror and uh, the present spectral domain, it uses the broad, uh, broad bandwidth. So basically it does away with the moving mirror. So this reduces acquisition time, reduces the chances of any artifacts coming in and increases the reliability, overall reliability of the scan. So for glaucoma and detection, basically there are three main analysis that we use. The RNFL analysis, which is the most accurate. Second is the optic nerve head analysis and the GCC or the GCIPN, which also I will cover today. So uh, I'll be covering the Zeiss Cirrus in all the printouts. So I'll be explaining how to uh, interpret a Zeiss Cirrus report. First, we need to know what the normative database for the Cirrus is. So the age range is between 18 to 84 years. What this basically means is if you use a scan to scan a patient who is younger than 18 years, the normative database will not be available. Hence, comparisons may not be accurate. And uh, refractive errors between minus 12 to plus 8. So high myopes or high hyperopes may not give an accurate scan. There may be a lot of artifacts in the reports. So there are key, uh, this is a normal RNFL and optic nerve head scan that we see uh, for the Zeiss. There are, I'll explain each individual part. First is the key parameters that are highlighted in this uh, box. These are mainly for the optic nerve head valuation. The RNFL thickness map, the RNFL deviation map, the NRR thickness profile, the RNFL TSNIT profile, and uh, these are the uh, extracted D scans. I'll give you the importance of each of these as we go ahead. So first we'll cover the ONH analysis. So main parameters for glaucoma, which is the most accurate in glaucoma diagnosis, are the vertical rim thickness, the rim area, and the vertical cup disc ratio. ONH analysis through multiple studies has been shown to be useful in pre-perimetric glaucoma and in progression of glaucoma, but RNFL is much superior to this during the analysis. So this is basically extracted by an optic disc tube, which is 4 by 4 mm, centered on the optic disc. Uh, what is marked here, you can see in the black line, will be red, is the, the optic disc is marked by the end of the Brooks membrane and the cup is measured by an anterior offset of 150 to 200 microns, the line which intersects the ILM, that is marked as a cup. Uh, I'll explain, there is a new parameter called the Brooks membrane opening and the importance of that. We also see uh, the Cirrus also provides an opportunity to see the optic nerve head in a 3D view. This is used to calculate the cup volume. So the average RNFL thickness and symmetry is given here. Uh, this is now a definitely an abnormal scan. In an Indian population, you would see the average RNFL thickness would be about 100 to 105. So these both are very abnormal. The symmetry is only 67%. Generally, if you see a difference of greater than 10 between the right and left eyes, that indicates that there is a definite pathology. Uh, the disc area, the rim area are measured and the vertical CD ratio, like I mentioned, these are the most reliable criteria for diagnosing glaucoma. And the cup volume is extracted out of the 3D measurement. Uh, this is an important point which is uh, available. This is a relatively newer parameter used in glaucoma diagnosis called the Brooks membrane opening minimum rim width. And this is available only in the spectralis. So uh, instead of uh, just taking a random point like in the initial disk and cup analysis, the, like I said, the Brooks membrane opening marked the disk in the analysis while the cup was just uh, arbitrarily marked as a point which is 150 microns anteriorly. Here, the shortest horizontal distance between the cup and the, uh, between the Brooks membrane opening and the ILM is marked as, and it's calculated as the BMO MRW. So this is highly accurate in calculation, rather than the just uh, horizontal calculation that is normally used in the uh, series. But this particular modality is available only in the spectralis if you use the advanced uh, glaucoma module. Second, we we'll go to the RNFL analysis, which is the most important for glaucoma. When we use the default program, uh, the scan done is a 200 by 200 scan, and a calculation circle of 3.554 mm is uh, 
drawn across the disk through which this uh, calculation is done. Now, the importance of 3.54 is through multiple studies, it has been shown that uh, the circle of about 1.3 to 1.4 diameter, it gives the most uh, reliable and most repeatable RNFL readings. In this, which are larger or smaller, this 3.54 may not be accurate. We need to alter the RNFL analysis protocol. So like, this is the default protocol, which is a 3.4 mm. Uh, even the fast RNFL uses a 3.4 mm. Proportional circle, like I said, if there's a large myopic disc with a lot of peripapillary atrophy, or if there's a very small disc, the size of the circle can be tailored to that particular disc. And these are all similar protocols, the concentric free rings, which uses circular scans of 0.9 mm, 1.8, or 2.7 mm. RNFL map is something like an uh, analysis where it gives six scans. And the RNFL thickness is another scan which is also available. So the RNFL thickness map generally it gives an R glass pattern where if you see red colors, that is the hotter colors, they indicate better thickness and colder colors, the blue and the green indicate an RNFL thinning. This is the deviation map. This is the exact opposite here. Red and yellow indicates damage, whereas uh, gray indicates a little more nerve thickening. Uh, the extracted D scan is important because we need to avoid any artifacts. If this is truncated, like uh, if the B scan is extending upwards, downwards, if at any point it is cut, we may get an artifactual RNFL reading. So this has to be put. Whenever you are assessing an ONH, uh, whenever you are assessing a OCT map, this has to be checked that it is perfectly centered. And this is the proportional circle around which the RNFL is drawn. So this is a particular. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, do you have uh, images for artifacts in the presentation? Uh, no, sir, I couldn't cover artifacts, but I will explain artifacts in questions because this is too. Okay, okay. because that, that is very important. The moment they see it, they will realize how the segmentation lines change. Yes, so sir. that is very important. Visual impression is very important. Anyways, yeah. you, uh, you finish it, then we can discuss that. Right, sir. Yeah. Again, proportional circle, this is important because if you see this uh, red segmentation line indicates the inner limiting membrane. If the red segmentation line is cutting across the retina, across the OCT layers, this could again in introduce an artifact into the report. So these have to be particularly checked before we go ahead to the further analysis. So amongst the printout, we have an average RNFL thickness map. So this typically has the double hump pattern. If there is any flattening, that is the superior and the inferior areas which are first lost in glaucoma, this double hump pattern will disappear and it will get a more flatter profile. Then. Uh, Quadrantic RNFL thickness maps that is average into 90 degree sectors and clock hour RNFL maps which are average into 30 degree sectors are given. This is important because earlier defects will only show up at the clock hour maps. Whereas in the quadrantic maps, there can be something that's called quadrantic averaging. So early defects will be missed in this. So we have to check both of these in uh, combination. And now the relatively new uh, analysis that we do is called the GCC, the ganglion cell analysis. Now, ganglion cell analysis is basically an analysis of the ganglion cell, the nerve fiber layer, and the inner plexiform layer. And depending on which OCT we are using, this uh, analysis varies. So for the cirrus, it is the GCN and the IPL layers. But if you go for the spectralis, it is the complete retina from the Crookes membrane up to the inner limiting, mem inner limiting membrane. So these are not comparable across machines. So they're measured in number of, number of protocols available to measure the GCC IPL. You can use either the macular 200 by 200 scan or the 512 by 128 Q patterns. Uh, as of now, imaging of the GCC is fully indirect. There has been no direct measurement technology available, but research in those lines are underway. So why is a ganglion cell important? Is because the variability in a particular eye, in a normal eye, if the ganglion cell is a lot lesser as compared to the ONH, which can vary in high myopes. In um, high myopes, you can get a large size disc. In a hyper -op, you can get a smaller disc. There can be a lot of variation, including even in the RNFL, depending on the actual length and refraction. But the ganglion cell in the macula tends to be quite stable, remaining uh, limited to six layers, unless there is a pathology. So comparability is much better. Uh, the best parameter for glaucoma detection is the minimum GCIPL. I'll show that here. Yeah. So this is a GCC IPL scan for the cirrus. This has a thickness acquisition map. The color patterns are just as before. They're, uh, like I said, hotter colors indicate thickness. The bluer colors, uh, sorry, blue color indicates thickness and hotter colors indicate, uh, in, uh, yeah. And this is the deviation map. 
you can see that this complete area, this is in sectors, this is abnormal. The average and the minimum GCIPL are reduced in both of this. Uh, the average thickness, the average value for a GCIPL is about 100 microns. Anything below that is abnormal. This is a thickness table, sectoral map, and sectoral averaging. And similarly, the horizontal and vertical B scans, just like the RNFL map that we've covered. Uh, the SIRIS also has a glaucoma progression analysis. And this requires, again, like very similar to the HFA, this requires a minimum of three scans, where the initial two form the baseline, and any subsequent scan is used to, uh, to derive the GPA analysis. There is a legal uh, linear regression analysis, which determines the average RNFL thickness, superior, inferior RNFL thickness, as well as the average cup to disc ratio. This is plotted over time, over multiple scans, and the trend is analyzed to see if there is any significant change. The rate of change is given, the slope of this particular line is given as a rate of change. So you can determine whether the change is statistically significant or not. And there is also an RNFL summary, which will be given at the end. So this RNFL summary a bit helps uh, give us an idea whether that with the change that is seen on the OCT, whether you know is significant. So the RNFL thickness map progression that we see here, if there's a tick mark that indicates that there is a definite focal change over multiple scans that we see. The RNFL thickness profile progression, if that shows a tick, there it tends to be a broader focal change, something like a irregularly uh, irregular generalized depression. And if there is an average RNFL thickness progression, like we see here, there is a diffuse change, like a generalized depression in an HFA. So this, was, this is just like a small table which gives us a quick overview of what sort of change we are expecting in that particular field. Now, uh, this is like a cheat sheet which helps you determine which scan works best in early to moderate glaucoma. Uh, the RNFL is the most useful when it comes to preperimetric mild or moderate glaucoma for both structure, uh, its functional correlation as well as diagnosis. The OLH scan, the studies are very multiple. Some say that they are comparable, while some many others say that the ONH scans are inferior to the RNFL in diagnosis. The GCC scan, like I said, it has a definite role when in cases where uh, the uh, RNFL scans may be inaccurate, like in myopic eyes or when extremely small or large optic discs, or tilted discs or large peripatal atrophy, a GCC scan helps in uh, determining early change. In advanced change, uh, the GCC scan has been shown to have better diagnostic power than RNFL, and it shows to correlate well with the 10-2 visual field. Uh, the minimum BMO MRW that I said that's available only on the spectralis can also be used to follow up advanced glaucoma cases. Uh, some studies show that the minimum rim width and the uh, GCC are comparable, while some show that the GCC shows slightly better reliability as compared to the minimum rim width in advanced glaucoma. This is important because there is something that's called a floor effect. After the total RNFL, average RNFL thickness falls to about 40 to 60 microns, further change cannot be followed up using an RNFL scan. In such cases, we can use the GCC scan to follow up the patient for an OCT progression. Uh, so OCT result misinterpretation, there are multiple factors which can result in a artifactual result. If the machine is improperly calibrated, if there are excessive temperature fluctuations or humidity, again, the scan, the signal scan index has to be checked if this is a poor signal strength. Ideally, the signal strength should be eight and above. If anything below six should be rejected. Or if there's a decentered scan, if generally, uh, if there is a defect on the edge of the field, sometimes we can get uh, artifactual results. Patient factors is if the patient has a poor fixation with a constantly moving eye, uh, we can get motion artifacts. If there's a poor ocular surface, like a dry eye or the patient is unable to fix it, then again, we can get uh, improper results. So ideally, before a scan, the patient is asked to close his eyes, and immediately before, while after he opens his eyes, the scan should be taken. Again, if there's any media opacity, like a cataract or a PCO, the quality of the scan may drop. And extremes of age, like 80 to 84 was the normative data. If the normative data isn't available, the scan reliability goes down. Operative factors uh, like improper demography and the edge effect. Like I said, if this is if you're doing a manual acquisition. If there is a if there is a peripheral scan that we need to do, and uh, it cannot be properly focused, we may get an edge effect into the scan. Higher refractive errors, particularly myopia, tend to show an artifactual RNFL thinning because they're, they're increased actual length. Vitreous lotus can show shadow artifacts into the field. A PVD is an important point that we need to consider because a PVD, especially if it's an incomplete PVD, 
can uh, if it is giving a traction onto the retina it can show artifactually uh, higher readings of the rnfl and as soon as the EVD detaches, then it becomes a complete EVD, the RNFL may regress to a lower value. So this may be falsely interpreted as progression, while actually there is no real progression. Same thing applies to an epiretinal membrane. The floor effect I've already mentioned, if the readings fall below 40 to 50 microns, uh, further progression cannot be followed on the RNFL scans because the existing uh, Mueller processes and the uh, structural framework will still show up. So if you get an RNFL reading of zero, that is never possible in RNFL scan, that is 100% artifactual. And also non glaucomatous osteopathic neuropathies like traumatic or toxic neuropathies have to be considered. A diagnosis cannot be based just on an OCT scan. Quadrantic averaging, I have mentioned. Severe PPA is important when we are doing the RNFL scan. If there's a large PPA and the 3.4 mm circle falls into the area of peripapillary atrophy, again, you may get a very low to zero reading on the RNFL. So the circle size has to be varied. Uh, I'll also cover a couple of slides on the newer modality, which is OCT angiography. So uh, there, uh, Karthik, yes, sir. Uh, we can make a very passing mention on OCT angio because that will not be asked to any of the students except okay, theoretical questions. What I would like to do is the trend of questions that I'm seeing on the chat is everybody wants to know how to interpret a uh, OCT printout. So I just want you to go to the first slide and interpret the printout for them, please. Okay. Yeah. So this is asked in the, yeah, now you can uh, just magnify that particular slide and then you can start describing uh, stepwise how to, with your arrow or cursor, how okay. to interpret. So this is a ONH and RNFL scan. This doesn't have the GCC analysis in it. So this is the key parameters that is the patient data which will be used for normative analysis. We have to check the date of birth of the patient for normative compare. Uh, there is no refractive error in this because OCT doesn't do a correction. And after that, we, uh, if you go to the data table out here, like I mentioned, there are multiple uh, readings that are given here. The, our average RNFL thickness for an Indian population, uh, multiple studies have shown that the readings vary between 104 to 110. So that would give you a guide if the readings are falling below that, that could indicate an abnormality. RNFL symmetry should ideally be about 90%. If there is an interocular uh, difference in average RNFL readings greater than 9 or 10 microns, that could indicate an abnormality. But this is because uh, test retest variability of an OCT is about 5 microns. So two standard deviations greater than that is recorded as abnormal. So anything, any difference greater than 10 microns is recorded as abnormal. Rim area, cup, disc area, uh, disc area. One important point is the color uh, scheme that we see here. Uh, the red indicates abnormality. Yellow is borderline and green is normal. Gray indicates that there is no particular normative data available. So as we can see, the disc area is always given as gray because there is no normative data available for disc area. Also, if the disc area falls below about 1.5 or uh, 1.3 or more than 2.5 mm square, then the CD ratio as well as the cup volume, they also come out as great because uh, the Ceres normative database doesn't have data for those uh, those disks in the analysis. Uh, Karthik, yes, sir. Uh, any specific sequence do you recommend them to see on when they see an OCT printout? Would you I recommend thought... this as the first table to see or would you recommend them, recommend them some different sequence? I follow the sequence. Uh, nicely marked here, one, two, three, four, five. But would be would this be the sequence that you would follow normally, or would you follow something different? Uh, ideally, and sir. For the sake of simplicity, that this is marked. But uh, do you follow this sequence, or uh, no? Uh, uh, no, this is the interpretation. So for to rule out, like I said, if there is if the scan is reliable or no, we have to see the signal strength index first. Correct. Correct. Then we have to check if the like I said, the horizontal tomograms are not truncated. Now you can see the horizontal tomogram here is uh, nicely centered. In an improperly acquired scan, it may either be deviated upwards or downwards, or if there is, uh, we have to look at the deviation maps also, like this purple circle is the measurements. Essentially, uh, yes, as you said correctly, first is the quality, that is a proprietary index of that particular company. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Then you see the segmentation maps here. So, the, like you see, reliability indices on perimetry, there are certain things you see on the OCT first. That is the quality, 
then you go to these maps and the third one is you go to the rnfl thickness map now any of this map shows you black patches or black spots that is a problem with data acquisition or if you see this disk which is some something appear like a, a, in, a split into two to three parts or it is shaken or some patches are absent then it means that the image is not of a good quality so that is the first thing that everybody should see and then uh, karthik you can continue about the thickness map uh the yes, deviation sir. yeah yeah motion motion artifacts are like uh, one important thing is you need to follow the vessels if you see there's a break in the vessel continuity that could indicate a motion artifacts so again that scan is unreliable uh truncation of the of these scans i have mentioned and then we look at the nrr uh, thickness profile and the rns rnfl thickness profile so the rnfl thickness profile normally it follows a double hump pattern like i said as glaucoma progresses the rnfl thickness goes down so this pattern gets a little more flattened this has to be uh, this is the sectoral analysis where like i said 90 degree sectors the superior and inferior fields are normally the ones that are earlier affected the uh, one important thing that you need to know is that the isnt rule that we use for clinical analysis doesn't really apply uh, to the oct so you may not always see an inferior loss first though the superior and inferior will be the first ones affected you may initially see a superior loss which is more than the inferior also and we need to see the sectoral loss the sectoral loss is a uh, clocker loss is important because it helps us correlate that with the clinical picture if you see a particular rnfl loss in this sector we need to correlate it with the clinical photograph to see if that particular disc has an area of damage or an rnfl defect which can be highlighted on a red free photograph corresponding to this and also if there is any functional loss which corresponds to this if there is a corresponding uh, arcuate defect on the in the inferior field corresponding to this sector so this is just an overview of how we interpret the map in 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 short uh, here if you see the cup average cd ratio which is defined as the vertical and the horizontal then yes, uh, well, what uh, what this cd ratio is need not necessarily conform to the cd ratio that you see on clinical examination that is what you should know yes. the definition of the cup and the disc is different uh, as defined for the machine interpretation vis a vis the clinical examination this is what you should know don't get surprised if you get a different cd ratio here then what you see on clinical examination that is very important for you to know yes sir generally octs they tend to overestimate the cd ratio so clinically you need to measure it properly this is just to correlate it everything has to be taken in uh, jointly uh, so i can i go into angiography just the three terms and then i'll finish yeah yeah you can go into just um, mention that such a entity exists because they will not go into details of angiography except a theoretical question which they can read up from any book but you can yes. just show them the slides how they look basically so, yeah so basically i just cover in two short slides what oct angiography is done doing in glaucoma three main terms you need to know is the flow index the vessel density and uh, something where is called cmvd or choroidal microvascular dropout the flow index is calculated by a protocol which is called the ssada vessel density is the one that is most used to determine glaucoma progression and cmvd is mainly important in areas of peripapillary atrophy it's basically a complete loss of chorio capillaris in areas of ppa so applications in glaucoma is if you see a reduced flow index of vessel density in the onh or peripapillary okay i didn't mention that uh, for glaucoma there are mainly three areas that are scanned the optic nerve head the peripapillary area and the macula so if you see a reduced re flow index or a vessel density in the onh or the peripapillary area uh, in glaucoma but again multiple studies have shown that rnfl has better diagnostic ability vessel densities in the macular region may also be reduced in glaucoma uh, here the uh, oct angio results and the gcc analysis are comparable and cmvd uh, the capillary microvascular dropout has shown a lot of topographic association with structural defects that is you can correlate it with an rnfl thinning or a lamina cribrosa defect as well as visual field loss and again swept source oct in glaucoma it is just a newer modality where the complete optic nerve head a uh, peripapillary rnfl and the macula can be scanned in one single scan without loss of any uh, signal strength or without loss of any sensitivity over the entire field so complete report will be bought in one one single scan which can be compared to a single field so we can do a better structure function co correlation okay so that was a nice talk uh, karthik you almost covered everything 
so now we will start taking questions uh, from the audience and before that uh, i would just like to make a few key comments uh, am i audible yes sir yes sir, yes, sir. yeah so uh, it is uh, just a minute uh, let me I'm not able to see this thing properly uh you can stop the screen share uh, uh, kartik sir one second one second uh, in uh, upper part of the okay, okay, yeah, yeah. okay so uh, a few things is that uh, it's very important to understand that uh, it's an optical device so the quality of image and uh, uh, the the quality of the scan will be very important for you to understand that if a quality poor or the image quality changes over time then its reliability for interpretation of progression is always suspect so always maintain standard imaging conditions as well as standard imaging protocols uh, because you are ultimately wanting to use this test like a test for diagnosing progression in glaucoma so this is very important uh, all different machines that it discussed it you saw that only two machines were discussed one was the spectralis and the other was uh, the cirrus because these two machines are standard and they have the capability of identification of uh, progression in glaucoma so that is very very important and uh, we will just take the questions now and accordingly answer uh, each one of them and add points as and when that is required so uh, one question says that uh, how do you define threat to fixation karthik yes uh, is this uh, by field so threat to fixation like i said is called a macular split so there are multiple definitions but what i follow is generally you need to do a macular program for that like i mentioned and if there are any two points at any two adjacent points across a meridian which has a zero decibel reading that indicates the macular split that indicates that one we want uh, there is one specific question when they are asking whether you define a threat to fixation differently as uh, as compared to a macular split that's what their question was i get some dr rajan was asking this question ki what is threat to fixation and what is macular split are they different like for uh, example you get a scotoma near fixation in your yes, 24 dash 2 That, mm-hmm. that's a threat to fixation so how do you define a threat to fixation well these are with a macular split uh sir actually like uh, clinically speaking threat to fixation germ area is defined as in the central 25 degrees so that could be the whole fixation but macular split is more uh, clinically oriented it has a prognostic value in this so, question differently uh, in case there is a zero uh, decibel value in a 24 dash 2 in a paracentral point Would you consider it a threat to fixation? And I will do a, I will do a ten dash two because, like I said, the bare area in a twenty four dash two is three degrees. Yeah. So when you do a ten dash two, the central three degrees, which the twenty four and the thirty dash two have no points, the central ten dash two has about twelve points inside. So that will help us further determine if there is an actual threat to fixation there. Yes, absolutely. So whenever there is a zero decibel threshold point, which is near the central or paracentral region. it is always a threat to fixation and if it is so then you have to definitely compulsorily go in and do a 10-2 field test to magnify the central portion and see now if you are wanting to do a surgery of our trabeculectomy in an advanced glaucoma and you have a zero decibel value near the central uh, part of the field then uh, you have to uh, look for the macular split and the split we have already defined on the chat it is a zero de- thre- decibel threshold in the macular size 5 program okay so this is very important that it should be a size 5 macular program and not a size 3 in which the split threat to uh, the split fixation is defined and if the fixation is split then there is a chance that there may be a chance of wipe out theoretically as per the papers okay so now we take the next question uh, is um, uh relation of pupil size to perimetry i think you covered that well Well, what do you think is the minimum acceptable pupil size for doing a good field test beyond which you will get a ring scotoma see the hf uh, so the hfa normative database is generally done with a pupil size of 3 to 4 mm so that is the ideal pupil size below 2 mm it is recommended to dilate okay uh, so 2 mm is what you say be below 2 mm you should be dilating the pupil but whatever it is you should have a standard pupillary diameter as far as possible when you are doing subsequent fields subsequent fields yes. So now uh, the next uh, I have answered the question of which textbook to read. Uh, mm. 
Hmm. Most of the questions you answered in this uh, chat yeah. itself, sir. Yeah. There is a one question by uh, Nita, ma'am. That how do you uh, understand a vertical progression versus horizontal progression in perimetry? I would just like to take this opportunity to welcome Dr. Shonak Mukadam, sir, also in the lecture. He was there throughout the time. Thank you, sir, for being here. Uh, Karthik, sir, over to you. Yeah. Uh, sorry, vertical progression to horizontal progression. I am yeah. not really aware of what that is. So, uh, is. Is that question meaning to say that the direction of progression of scotoma in the field, is it what uh, she wants to ask? Because I will uh, unmute her. Uh, Dr. Nita, ma'am? Uh, Dr. Neeta, ma'am? Here? Uh, I'm trying to unmute her. Dr. Neeta, ma'am? Uh, can you please uh, clarify the question here? Here she Hello. comes online, you can take the next question. Yeah, okay, sir. Okay, uh, thanks. So, when do you decide to do an OCT for a patient? Karthik. <laughs> Ideally, sir, I do it for, if, generally, I do it for patients who are not uh, like any disc suspect. I do early glaucoma, generally, the RNFL scans are more accurate in early to uh, pre-perimetric glaucoma. In a case where I have a suspicious disc, a large cupping, but no particular field effect, and uh, there is no definitive sign of glaucoma in that patient, I would like to do a baseline OCT to determine the RNFL values. So and would for, you do it for every patient or not? In advanced glaucoma cases, it is not really helpful. Like I said, except for the GCC, uh, the RNFL beyond the uh, floor floor effect once it sets in, the RNFL will not detect any progression. So there, an uh, so OCT. It is the key word, advanced glaucoma limitation of, of doing uh, OCT, in which yes, visual yes. field test is uh, will give you more reliable data and the progression. Yes. But when the patient comes to you in early stage of glaucoma, would you consider OCT as a must, or would would it be optional for you? I generally do both, sir, because pre-perimetric cases sometimes may get picked up. Yes, so, like that I is said. very important. And secondly, sometimes you get variability in the fields. Fields are a subjective test, whereas this uh, OCT is an objective test. You have a lot of uh, patient dependence in perimetry, so patients can give you unreliable results in fields, but in OCT, it's an objective measurement where patient dependence is least. So, OCT, wherever it is possible, should be done. And a structure function correlation will always give you a robust uh, clinical picture. Okay, so that was the question. When do you decide to do? Okay, how frequently will you repeat the OCT, Karthik? Uh, generally, sir, if it's a glaucoma suspect or an early glaucoma, I just do it once or maybe once in six months in the initial diagnosis. Because, like I said, even the GPA for uh, serious requires three fields. I prefer a line. So maybe once in six months during the initial period. Once it gets as an established case, then I rely more on the fields than OCT for progression. So minimum of three I, three tests have to be done within the initial one and a half to two years. Now, the one more question is, please explain the basis of washout phenomenon in relation to trabeculectomy based on perimetry. Uh, so see, washout or wipeout or snuff out is relatively rare. The, the reported incidence is only about 0.1%. But uh, and many cases say that it is uh, it recovers after a few months. So generally, if a patient has a macular split, the definition of which I explained, when using a macular program, if you see a macular split, that particular patient has a higher risk for a snuff out when you're doing a trabeculectomy. So that has to be explained to the patient. Not that we won't go for the surgery, but a poorer prognosis has to be explained before you know going ahead with the surgery in that particular patient. Now, uh, another question, which is preferable in pre-perimetric glaucoma, established and advanced glaucoma respectively, as uh, spectral domain or swept source OCT? Sachin, you can answer it. I think Karthik's connection is... His internet connection is disturbed. Okay, so see, basically, there is nothing between, no difference between the spectral domain and swept source except the depth of acquisition and as well as the scan speed. So it is nothing. They are similar uh, technologies with a slight technical difference. They won't give you different information, although technically one device may be slightly faster than the other. Secondly, uh, in advanced glaucoma, there is very, very limited role of any imaging technique because of the floor effect which Karthik has already said. 
in pre perimetric and uh, pre perimetric early and moderate glaucoma definitely yes you can establish and even track progression on the oct provided your scanning parameters and the media clarity stay at a uniform level so whether it is a spectral domain or a swept source it doesn't really matter what matters is whether it has the software and the hardware which is important which can track the disk and uh, what we need to know is whether it has the hardware for torsional or reorientation or torsional alignment this is very important and no, not only two machines have it so which are used commonly which is a spectralis and a cirrus so it's very important to know that you are using the right machine before you use oct for glaucoma uh, evaluation okay so that is one and then uh, oct is done in all screening cases or only in the glaucoma suspect cases yes sir screening screening cases i do in all sir if there is a suspect because like i said pre perimetric cases established um, ocular hypertensive cases for patients who don't show any field defect many patients could be pre perimetric who are not started showing any field defect like i said about 60% of our so uh, my take on that is uh, am i audible yes sir yeah see oct angiography as of today doesn't have definite uh, advantage over the conventional oct Uh, the quantitative software for quantification of capillary loss is also not that well established and uh, uh, nothing to prove it superior to the existing uh, oct technology secondly it is very exquisitely sensitive to uh, uh, media opacities as well as motion artifacts so it is very very important to know that although it is a new technology it is far away from being used as a routine clinical tool in assessment of and progression of glaucoma at least in its current dispensation uh, future technology may help us more but uh, as of now the quantification and the reproducibility of oct a is not something uh, uh, great to talk about right now so i would still stick on to the conventional spectral domain or a swept source oct and just follow up all the parameters that is the uh, the disc the rnfl and the macula as karthik said the only Sorry. one thing is that uh, uh, the disc the rnfl and the ganglion cell is basically part of the same neuron so please don't visualize it as three separate maps it is the same thing that you are looking at with the ganglion cell body at the macula and the axon terminating in the optic nerve head so it is always advisable to look at the ganglion cell map along with the rnfl and the disc together to get the complete picture that is what we should know Sachin, can I ask my question? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, see, whenever we look at the progression analysis, sometimes we find that the PSD is usually the same, but the patient still complains. But when you go back to the numerical chart, you find that the scotoma has deepened. So my question was that is this vertical progression where the deepening of the scotoma happens much worse than the horizontal progression where there is addition of new points? I just wanted to know that. no see uh, if if there is going to be a deepening of the scotoma the psd is madam definitely going to change because the psd is basically modeled to detect the asymmetry in the field defect no, so but in, in fact have, what if you have a point which is less than 5% p value it will still hmm. be depicted as a black square correct so if your see, the, uh, happened, sensitivity has reduced happened. it will yeah. still be seen as something similar if there are no new points added Uh, so so what happens is uh, when it is less than p less than 1 then be yeah. it, you know p less than 1 is always going to be a, a black square of p less than 0.5 uh, let us take the example of a 24 2 2 and in in this case that is the importance that's why i made a comment on the chat that the gray scale black color is not the same as the black color on the probability map so the probability map after a certain level of change in probability will always become black but the gray scale will keep on changing from shades of white to black over a uh, range of 0 to 50 decibels so that is what we should know so although your pattern deviation map or your probability chart show the same black square the scotoma will show you deepening in the gray scale so that is where you should look at once it is reached the p less than 0.5 value on the probability map so you can easily make the uh, make out that change thank you sachin yeah. so the change is important uh, detected when the decibels uh, decibel value changes from 70 to 50 below 50 it is difficult to monitor that is what you mean once it is below 
then i didn't get you which map are you talking about decibel values yeah. are from uh, will be from 0 to 40 0 to 40 yeah decibel values no the psd value uh -huh. no no see what will happen so, psd was finish the the software or the algorithm was to detect irregularities in the field so once your scotoma as madam nita madam pointed out if the scotoma becomes bigger and occupies more and more part of the field actually psd will start reducing so psd will start becoming more and more normal because the it is not a localized scotoma anymore the soft, the the algorithm is to detect localized change that's why i made a point on the chat also psd was introduced to identify early scotomas so the moment the defect becomes advanced the psd loses its role so if you see most of the time once you go to the 10-2 and all those printouts you start relying more on the mean deviation changes over time so psds are basically uh, useful only for detecting early change and irregularities in the field rather than an index of progression of glaucoma that is the key difference initially when the scotoma is localized psd will be parallel to the md but when the scotoma becomes generalized the psd will start behaving differently because the algorithm was uh, uh, used to detect irregularities and not the depth of field the depth of field change is always md 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 so md over time the initial linear regression which was given was the standard to detect or will be the standard to detect uh, the field uh, defects forever at any degree of field defect early moderate late whatever but psd or psd based indices such as the vfi they start becoming faulty the moment the defect depth becomes more and the defect becomes more generalized so that can be ex explained with the help of examples but uh, we'll have to show more and more field charts so, acha sachin one for the benefit of the viva for the pgs yeah. they are given certain case scenarios like this that yeah. there is a normal uh, visual field analysis the oct yeah. is also normal but the iop measured is high after correction yeah. of uh, all the factors how will you approach and second is normal visual fields uh, OC oct shows that there is rnfl loss there there are no uh, scars around the optic now media is clear but the iop is normal so these are two case scenarios if if given how will how should the pg's answer how how should be so, their approach can you repeat the first scenario will take one at a time not not Okay, yeah, normal fields, enough. normal OCT, ha, normal fields, normal OCT and high IOP. Okay, so if you take by the definition here, you are saying that the IOP is above the defined mean range. So what it means is it yeah. is a hypertension pressure above the normal range. Whereas when there is no disc and field change, that means there is no glaucoma. So this is classical ocular hypertension. So yeah. everything that is given by the old study, old study. you have to. study very clearly that the ocular hypertension does not mean you treat at say 22 you don't treat at 23 unless obviously 24, there are other sir. factors like family history or you have other eye of having glaucoma or uh, vasculopathic age group or whatever any risk factors are there you will treat not no arbitrary number beyond 21 is the indication of treatment but the old study does say that if at all you have any risk factors and you decide to treat then you have to get the pressure down at least by 30% and that will prevent the progression of glaucoma further so the decision whether to treat or not will be individualized depending upon the risk factors and the patient profile but this case will be classically defined as a case of ocular hypertension so the moment you get a clinical case scenario it is important for you to classify the case whether it is an open angle whether it is angle closure whether it is glaucoma or not whether it is pure ocular hypertension whatever it is once you classify the case or the classify the diagnosis the examiner knows you are on the right track so that is the first thing that you should do what is the yes. second scenario normal fields ocd yeah. shows that there is some rnfl loss but the iops are normal okay kartik i want you to take that first then i'll take it so sir so, 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 if there is a normal field and ocd showing some rnfl loss first you yeah. check if it's a reliable field uh, if it's a reliable field and there is damage this could indicate preperimetric glaucoma now iop normal does not always mean that uh, it is normal throughout So one thing we need to check is the central corneal thickness. If it's a thinner CCT, 460, 470, that could indicate an artifactual IOP reading on the GAT. And the second most important thing in such cases is to do a diurnal variation, because the IOP measured at that particular point may be normal, but uh, the diurnal curve, that is, IOP tends to be highest morning times and all. So if you do a variation, we can detect these cases and re-diagnose them as POAG rather than normal. 
in such cases. So, uh, see, the, the important thing is in any any case of glaucoma, all comments should be reserved till such a time you get the entire investigative modalities in place. So, not only the intraocular pressure, you do the central corneal thickness, you do the fields, you do the OCT, and uh, you do uh, uh, you do the fundus examination. Yeah, this photography. You do everything. The moment you do all these things, you collate the data together. As he said, very importantly, intraocular pressure normal does not mean that the glaucoma. It's it's a it's not a case of glaucoma. As he said, do a diurnal variation. The most important thing I would add to this is the gonioscopy. In because I am considering that the gonioscopy has already been done. But angle closure disease always many times presents as normal pressures. So even in the diurnal variation, you may pick it up or may not pick it up. But if it is an occlusal angle and he has a normal pressure, that there is no reason to believe that this is a normal tension glaucoma. So your gonioscopy and all the other findings are very important. So as he rightly said, three points to check: one is central corneal thickness, second is diurnal variation, and make sure that the gonioscopy is showing you an absolutely open angle. If there is any iota of doubt, always better to repeat a gonioscopy or cross check with the ASCT or UBM, just in case you are unsure about things like plateau iris syndrome or something like that. So uh, this definitely uh, uh, the R, uh, OCT abnormality will definitely not be taken like lightly, especially if it is a sectoral loss where you are even clinically seeing on the disc that uh, a comparable change has taken place. So you should never discount OCT saying that. Uh, it is not reliable or it's not good enough because off and some statements are made like that. But by and large now all OCT give a reasonably good uh, definition of RNFL at least. So you should not discount it and exactly follow the steps that Karthik has told. So it's very important. Okay, so I uh, this one question here it says have GPX, BCC, and HRT lost their value with the advent of OCT? What do you say, Karthik? So actually, I have no experience with the GDX, but we used to use the HRT quite frequently. Uh, HRT was used mainly for the RNFL analysis, and it has a level of subjectivity which the OCT doesn't have. The OCT it automatically charts the optic nerve head and all, whereas the HRT we need to manually mark the uh, the the margins of the optic nerve and the cup. So unless there is a reliable scan, and you know there is a lot of intra inter observer variability, that is why. There can be a lot of errors that will come in in HRT. That's why an OCT is a more reliable machine. And, and basically nowadays, HRT, HRT is not being manufactured anymore, and GDX VCC has been stopped manufacturing long back. So long most back. of the devices, in fact, are not available. So the question of losing value is not there. HRT has been always a good machine for uh, examination of the disc. Only thing that you have to mark the disc yourself at the visit number one, and the subsequent visits uh, that used to be superimposed on every examination. But uh, since now they are not manufactured, there is uh, it, it is not very relevant to talk about them anymore. But theoretically, you should know at least about the HRT, if not the GDX VCC. Okay, so there is one more question: How clinically relevant is CETA swap, and is it used clinically beyond early detection? So CETA swap, it is basically uh, it approaches glaucoma from a different. It uses the corneocellular path. Uh, Is it the corneal cellular pathway? It is a particular subset of ganglion cells that is about it occupies I think five percent of the total ganglion cell volume, and it is said to detect glaucoma about three to five years earlier than a standard automated test. But there are multiple problems. The one thing is the swap; the duration is much longer, uh, and it uses a uh, different stimulus. The background stimulus is higher, but the yellow stimulus that we use, the blue on yellow, the blue stimulus is much lower intensity. So it is much more difficult, even for a completely normal patient, to do a swap. The duration is longer, and hence the reliability of that test goes down. Like if we get a normal patient who has a foveal threshold of 30 or 32, if you do a swap, you will detect a foveal threshold of 28 or 26 in such patients. But that may not necessarily be abnormal because it is very difficult to do, time-consuming, and if you actually see the CETA swap being done. You realize it's not an easy test to do at all, and perimetry, no. inter-test variability is something is always a pain in the neck. So, by and large, it is fallen out of favor because of all these points. So, yes. although most of the high-end machines have it, it is hardly ever used in clinical practice. Okay, so uh, how does that? Right, master. Uh, 
Okay, so a glaucoma suspect patient, even after doing all glaucoma screening tests like OCT, CCT, HFA, gonio, I had still patient is a glaucoma suspect post screening test. How further to follow? I think you have discussed this already. Uh, uh, on follow up on the HFA, mm, what is yeah, so uh, what is more important indication of doing a HFA, high IOP or disc changes suggestive of glaucoma? Both are indications. I mean, uh, high IOP is definitely depending, like you already mentioned, so it could be an ocular hypertension, could be a POAG, could be a, a PACG in the incipient stage. They all are indications for doing an HFA. And if there is a disc change, then there is definitely an indication to do a structure function correlation. So both are definite indications. Uh, uh, what we just mentioned was without doing uh, all the baseline tests that we just described, there is no point in even describing a patient of glaucoma. So our baseline tests are absolutely indicated and mandatory in all the patients. So if HFA is mandatory, without HFA, you cannot find whether the patient is a glaucoma or a ocular hypertension, as simple as that, because definition is this can feel change. So, if you go by the definition that answers the question, there is one question to me. It says, how does yoga, kapal bhati and shirshasan affect the uh, Definitely, shirshasan does affect kapal bhati. I am not aware of a study of kapal bhati being done, but shirshasan study has been done and it is known that shirshasan increases the, uh, causes a drastic elevation of intraocular pressure. So, uh, large amount of uh, single episode water drinking, more like liters of water or shishnasan are not recommended definitely for patients of glaucoma or established glaucoma. This, they will uh, definitely cause progression due to the sporadic increase beyond say 50 or 60 kg of mercury. So definitely shishnasan is contraindicated for glaucoma patients. Anything to add Karthik? Uh, 